All right, welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us this morning. It is actually our last officially scheduled session in this uh, digital pathology webinar series that has gone on for well over a year. So it's really exciting and I just wanted to Thank everyone for joining and then thank everyone for all of their participation and uh, collaboration throughout this series, uh, especially to Hannah, who has really done an amazing job coordinating us all and getting us together, as well as all of our speakers and panelists. So I am uh, Dr. Maggie Flanagan, the Neuropathology Core Leader at Northwestern University. Uh, I will be moderating today and I'm really excited to introduce uh, Dr. David Gutman, who is an Associate Professor of Neurology, Psychiatry, and Pathology at Emory University. He is specifically a physician data scientist who focuses on developing novel informatics approaches to the management and analyses of large clinically relevant data sets. And uh, today he will be presenting on open source software options, DSA and sample de-identification um, as an introduction for us all. And hopefully this will provide us with just a, an overview on the available open source digital pathology software options for image analysis and data sharing. Um, and then after uh, Dr. Gutman's presentation, this will be followed by a live question and answer session. And our uh, additional panelists will join us at uh, that time. So I will pass this over to David Gutman and uh, look forward to seeing your presentation. Thank you. Okay, are my slides sharing? Yep. Okay, cool. So um, thanks for inviting me, Maggie, or Dr. Flanagan. Um, so my name is Dave Gutman. I, my only disclosure is that I am a psychiatrist, not a neuropathologist. Um, and I'm going to just talk about some of the tools that my team and Lee Cooper's team um, have been developing to analyze um, whole slide images. Uh, and this has been... I've been doing it for like a decade now. Um, and I'm also gonna talk about some, um, some of the challenges and some of the kind of potential opportunities in this space. Hopefully I won't talk too long so we can get to the panel. So I'm not shockingly, I'm gonna focus primarily on some of the open source stuff that our team's been developing. Um, give you a, some basic feature overview and some of the capabilities that we've really focused on in our tools and I'll explain why. Um, also talk about one of the challenges, particularly in neuropathology, which is image de-identification, talk about some of our analysis tools that we've developed, and then some, um, some work we're doing in neuropathology that um, we've been working on over the past year with a lot of people on this call. So it's a complicated story, but um, I'm a psychiatrist, but for the past decade or so, I've spent most of my time developing tools for, um, for cancer pathology. And this was largely because the NCI released 27,000 whole slide images about a decade ago that served as grist for the mill for um, Lee and I, Dr. Cooper and I to basically start developing these open source tools. So we developed something called the Digital Slide Archive, which is a, it's at this point, it's a platform that helps manage, annotate, share, analyze, and integrate these um, whole slide image collections, which can be many, many terabytes of data and really are not amenable to just, you know, keeping on a flash drive on your computer. So one of the things that um, can get a little bit confusing is I also talk about something called the CDSA. So this Cancer Digital Slide Archive was a specific version of the DSA that um, I've been maintaining for a very long time that's publicly available and has, uh, like I said, 25,000 whole slide images available for visualization. Um, we several, actually a long time ago now, we got some funding from the NCI to actually develop some of the software that Lee and I developed um, kind of in our own labs and get software engineers behind it. So it's actually much higher quality. And some of the jargon we'll throw around is the DSA. Usually I'm not talking about that. It's usually about managing the images and the, and the metadata. We've also developed some algorithms, mostly Lee actually, um, called Histomix TK, which is now Python installable, which allows you to do a lot of um, basic uh, image analysis functions on whole slide images. We also have a plugin system that allows us to add new functionality, which I'll tell you tell about later. One of the things I like about the system is that it's 
not just for whole slide images. So you can actually manage um, radiology images. You can upload PDFs like uh, pathology reports. And it has a really nice API, which allows you to do what I enjoy most, which is basically building mashups or customizations because none of the tools are perfect out of the box really for any specific application. One of the other things is we have a job execution and management pipeline built in. So one of the things that becomes challenging is, you know, chugging through terabytes of imaging data on your laptop um, is, doesn't work unless you have a very big laptop. So just briefly, the Cancer Digital Slide Archive is something that Lee and I developed forever ago, built on top of the DSA. And the key thing I really want to show for this NeuroPath group is, even though it's a slide, you know, it allows you to look at slides and zoom and stuff like that, kind of the real magic is that you can also pull up relevant metadata. So you can pull up pathology reports, you can pull up clinical data or tabular data that was provided by the NCI. You can easily switch between cases, et cetera. So, you know, I, I, as I, I think I called myself a physician data science. So Lee, Lee Cooper generally focuses a lot more on the machine learning and I focus more on the metadata and um, uh, UI part of the equation to make the data more manageable. Because without this, essentially all the data is, essentially, I, I've been calling it a digital shoebox where you know the data is in there somewhere, but you know, so, sorting through tens, you know, 50 shoeboxes in your garage somewhere to find the picture or image you're looking for doesn't scale well. So, you know, out of the box, the DSA provides basic image management capabilities. You can drag and drop files. You can assign metadata to images. You know, you can create folders, all these sorts of, um, you know, basic functionality. The most important thing actually is unlike, um, you know, I've used the Aperio image scope or scan scope software. And one of the things that's really hard is adding custom metadata or organizing projects. One of the things that's nice about the way we've developed the system is that every image or every object can have metadata associated with it. So what I mean by that is, you know, when you scan a whole slide image, and I'll go into this in a minute, we don't actually, there's no real naming convention, there's no nothing. So all I know about it, that this is purple and white. So in order to actually get any context out of it, you have to associate these raw images with some sort of structure. In this example, I'm showing some stuff from Fox data, from Foxes, because I don't have to worry about HIPAA. But this allows you to you know, essentially organize things and, and build collections of images for subsequent analysis. We've also spent a lot of time building in a lot of tools for slide naming and metadata management. Typically, when you scan hundreds or thousands of slides, particularly in brain banks, or at least in our brain bank, the labels are they're somewhat standardized, but it's not like there's this magical barcode where you can read all the information. So we're trying to eliminate a lot of the tedium of it, essentially pulling off the relevant information from the slide label and, and actually making it useful within the system. Um, the only reason I'm showing this slide, and it'll come up a little bit later, is the DSA also doesn't necessarily have to um, eat all of your data. So you don't have to have this one big system that has tens or hundreds of terabytes of data. It supports cloud storage, and you can also index files, which means it, um, you don't actually have to make a copy of you know, hundreds of images as long as the system can access it, kind of like a shared drive, probably at your university, it's able to access things. There are some trade-offs um, that I can go into um, about this, but overall, it's, it, it's a very flexible system for image management. So one of the things that we've spent by far the most amount of time on is building tools for image markup and labeling. So a whole slot, you know, we did a lot of stuff with glioblastoma, an individual G GBM slide. There can be over 100,000, sometimes up to 500,000 individual nuclei on an image. And, you know, as the budding computer scientist um, that, that takes over my soul sometimes, you know, we want to go in and actually assign a label to all 500,000 cells. Now, not only do you want the either the, not a human, but you know, you usually want the computer to do part of it. And then you still wanna be able to go in and actually look at the results, change them, clean them up, make sure the data actually makes sense. So we've spent a lot of time building in these sort of capabilities. And one of the most important distinctions about what I'm talking about versus some other um, software that we'll talk about a little later is this is all web-based. So this can all be done where the data is living either on a server in your university or a server in the cloud or even on your laptop, depending on your use case. The other thing that's nice is we have the ability, you know, we'll talk about histomics decay in a minute, but 
you're not locked into using the, the algorithms and tools that we've developed. Um, you can basically bring your own algorithms and run them within our platform or better yet, or if you want, you can actually run them separately and then just import the results. So it, it's designed to be flexible, which is one of the biggest uh, advantages of open source. And like I said, you know, you have 500,000 objects. If, you're, um, if you have enough time, you can actually go in and change labels, change metadata, even on the individual object level. So this is primarily Dr. Cooper's baby. But we've also developed Histomics TK, which is a set of um, mostly Python-based functions and classes that allow you to go in and, in this example, it's a blob detector. So we've gone in and found every, or just about every nuclei, or until we assign a label, these are just purple blobs. One of the um, things that we've been working on over the past year, since most of our funding and effort has been in the cancer space, most of the DSA functionality works out of the box for Neuropath, but you know the biggest challenge really is kind of coming up with tuning essentially and changing parameters so that it's compatible with the types of stains um, and the types of images and the types of data we might see in neuropathology as opposed to you know um, cancer where we primarily analyze just H and E's. So like I said, Oh, oh, that's weird. Sorry, I didn't realize I opened the Q&A box over. So like I said, we have it set up where you can pull up a slide, you hit submit, it'll start nuclei detection. In the background, it actually spins up a little compute cluster, um, and this can be scaled so it doesn't just have to run on your laptop, it could run on a bigger server in your lab or in the cloud. And then the most exciting part is when it's done, it actually then displays the results directly back onto the whole slide image. In this demo, I guess I only ran it on a square, but it it, it would run on the entire image as well. It's, it's the same thing. And like I said, not only do you get sort of the, the high level, you can also zoom in and actually view individual results and provide feedback to uh, train, improve, enhance your model. Like I said, you know, we don't want this just to be a black box where you just, you know, hit F5 or hit F7 and it's a, you know, gives you a diagnosis or a dust classification for you. In all of these domains, you need to be able to go in and inspect the results because there's just a lot of um, noise in these systems. So, you know, Lee, Lee in particular has done a, a lot of work with our annotation capabilities. We really call it like feeding the deep learning engine as, as even if you're not intimately familiar with um, deep learning, kind of the biggest, um, the food for these engines is really large amounts of data that are well annotated. Like I said, uh, uh, it's kind of a duplicate slide. So now I'll talk a little bit about what I spend a majority of my time, which is basically dealing with the metadata. So at Emory, we've scanned, I don't know, thanks to Dr. Geary's help, 27,000 slides or something like that. But right now I, need to be able to associate them with diagnosis. I need to know what the stain was used. I need to know the blocking. I need to know the region and all those things. And so there's quite a bit of um, data wrangling that's involved in actually making these image collections usable for any sort of downstream analysis. Um, and so, I mean, I think this, is, this goes throughout most of what we do. If you have garbage data, perfect model, you produce garbage, perfect data, garbage model, garbage results. So, you know, it's this guy go or garbage in, garbage out problem, which can be particularly challenging in neuropathology, um, as I'll get to. So over the years, I've been involved in a number of projects across domains. And the biggest problem in my mind, at least at this point, now that AI is, you know, really kind of had exponential growth over the past, well, I guess, decade. It really, in our domain is really getting the data. Um, so there's PHI challenges. I'll talk about some of our solutions to that. And some of the things I've worked in, there's actually licensing issues. So I've been involved in this big melanoma project across universities and, you know, we want to make all the data publicly available, but some universities want it to be Creative Commons, some want it to be Creative Commons licensed, but only for non-commercial uses. Some of them want recognition. And so at scale, this becomes kind of a, a pain. And then particularly, you know, a lot of the people on this call have been working on this with me is the metadata, essentially what is, is. So, you know, I look at all of these images, I'm not a dermatologist, and if I had to guess which one was a melanoma, I would have been wrong. Uh, you know, these two are not these three, they all look quote unquote bad to me. But the question is, how do we even know these are melanomas? 
Um, and I'm using this as an example because in this case, you can either wait and see if it grows. That's a form of ground truth. Or you actually cut it off and do pathology. So that's another form of ground truth. But this is also complicated because, again, this image is probably taken on a camera, in this case, a dermoscope, derm a dermoscope and that um, pathological confirmation comes days, weeks, or months later, well, probably days or days or week, hopefully. Um, and so, you know, you have to assign, essentially imagine taking a photo on your cell phone and trying to match it up with something in an EMR a week and a half later. It's, it's you know, there's a lot of bells, there's a lot of hoops to jump through. So particularly in this whole slide image domain, uh, I think as, I don't want to review too much about PHI, but the images themselves are gigantic. You know, they're two, two gigs, three gigs, four gigs at times. And PHI must be removed from the images prior to sharing. Unfortunately, with few exceptions, there's actually not very good tools to actually do this. Um, our team is working on some and Dr. Pierce has also developed some, but the actual rules and guidelines to quote unquote, de-identify a large image set are, um, honestly to be to be determined. I'm actually on the DICOM working group that's sort of working on what the standards are, but it's a bit nebulous. And, and an example would be, you're not really supposed to have any dates in a file. So our system allows you to automatically remove it, but we can even get into discussions where we have the date, not of necessarily when it was scanned, but the date of an update, it's still a date. Should we remove it? You know, you get into these sort of um, esoteric conversations. The other thing is there's a lot of scary metadata that's hiding in places that are difficult for people who don't use the word Linux and Ubuntu and uh, Python regularly, where the, you'll say, quote unquote, the image looks fine, which is what normally people look at. But if you kind of dig around in the uh, image metadata, kind of similar to DICOM headers, if you know that domain, there's actually just lots of potential places where this stuff can be hit hiding. Here's a date, you know, there's other, sometimes you'll see uh, scanner names, you'll see in information about the university or something like that. And technically, well, not technically, that you, all that stuff needs to be removed. There's other places too, where it turns out, I mean, most of you are probably aware of the whole, you know, the, we'll call it the chunk of brain tissue itself usually doesn't have any identifying information on it. But, you know, every slide has a slide label they also often contain a macro image where sometimes, depending on how much time you want to spend with it, even if an Im a label has been blackened out, if you play around with the contrast, you can actually recover PHI. So like in this case, um, this little black box right here, I was I just noticed it. So A, there's a date here, which is bad, but um, you know, I could say, well, it's I could say, well, the date, it's no, it's not relevant, it's has nothing to do with the patient. But it turns out even this black bar, if I um, actually one of our tools, I was playing around with something. And for whatever reason, when I hot when I hovered over this cell, the the website or my website actually just changes the contrast a little bit. And I realized, oh, nuts, there's like a name under here that, you know, again, it's not apparent to the eye. And a lot of this gets even more complicated. If people are reviewing tens or hundreds of these, they're not going, they're probably not looking at it on a 1K monitor. It's probably this tiny little thumbnail they're looking at in the corner. They're like, ah, it looks good. I don't see any names. So one of the, you know, I mentioned our system supports plugins. Um, we've been working on a, essentially a de-identification plugin um, that we're building into the DSA that allows you to essentially point the system to a directory. It will import the raw files. And then really the hardest part, we have an amazing software engineer that Lee and I work with named Dave Manthe, who's able to do all of the, you know, bit level editing. So we, you know, we can redact or remove um, the label image. We can remove macro images. We can even remove pieces of the, um, the entire image itself if we see things in there. But we're working on sort of a rule set. So as we go through, and I didn't show you all 180 fields or something like that of embedded metadata. But we, one of the things we want to start slowly developing is a rule set. So, you know, if this is, looks like a floating point number and the system and it, you know, 7566, I don't think that's a patient identifier. Um, I know it's not a patient identifier, actually. So we can start writing a rule set that can make this. It's, I, I don't think it's ever going to be completely automated. There's always going to be some level of secondary review, but it can be much, much much fewer clicks essentially that allows you to um, 
essentially take your whole slide image data set, run it through these filters that will strip off anything and everything that is considered um, PHI, and then ideally even allow you to share that with, uh, with your colleagues. Oops, wrong button. Um, I don't want to leave Dr. Pierce out. He's also developed something very similar that, um, that's a de-identifier, particularly for Aperio images, which is one of the more common systems. Now, the other thing I want to mention um, in this domain, because like I said, I'm not a neuropathologist. So what is ground truth? So all of the, well, I'll say just about all of these models um, require some sort of ground truth. Essentially, what are you looking for? So for melanoma, for the melanoma images I was showing, the ground truth is actually someone cutting it out, you know, doing pathology on it, and then a, you know, a, a derm, path, derm, derm path looking at it and saying it's a melanoma, it's not melanoma, whatever the diagnosis is. Although even in that case, there's, there's considerable inter-rater an intra-rater reliability issue. So even the same person may, even the same group of three or five, four people may not agree it actually is a melanoma, which calls into question this idea of ground truth, but it's still pretty good. Um, you can also have multiple clinicians simply looking at the image and agree it's benign. So, you know, not, it, it's not reasonable to, you know, every freckle on someone, you're not gonna biopsy and say, you know, it's definitely not a melanoma, you're, you know, there'll be some sort of consensus. So in the neuropathology domain, you know, we've been working with a consensus of X neuropathologists, three, four, five, whatever it needs to be. There's also special stains you could potentially compare, you know, the current thing to. And I don't know if he's on, so I don't know if I should make fun of him. I was calling the WJCS, which is what John Query says criteria. You know, at certain point, it's, you know, how many, how many, is it tractable to get five neuropathologists to look at every, you know, every brown spot on a slide, or do you just, um, you know, go with go with one expert and you know see how good you can get? Now, the, a lot of the explosion in AI has happened with reference data sets. So, ImageNet is, uh, there's, I don't know, 14 million images in it, and each node in the ImageNet has 500 images. Pretty good. Now, fortunately, the type of stuff ImageNet was essentially built around was stuff that you don't have to go to medical school, hopefully, to know the difference of. I know what trucks look like. I know what horses look like. I know what cats look like and birds. Um, you know, but a deer versus an antelope, maybe I'd get it confused. But this is a relatively simple task to collect huge amounts of data. Um, but as you'll see in a second, how do we, you know, how we generate these labels becomes very complicated in medical images. So dog versus cat, relatively straightforward most of the time. What about dog versus cat 2.0? Where, you know, okay, these are both cats, but is it a Siamese cat or a Sphinx cat? I no longer have a, well, you know, I no longer am an expert to differentiate between the Egyptian male and a Bombay. Um, so even on quote unquote simple tasks, you know, there is a, a degree of um, domain expertise required uh, to actually use the data for anything useful. So what's nice compared to 10 years ago is, or five years ago, really, is that off the shelf AI is actually getting pretty good. So I did this last night. I, I just typed in, there's this new model that came out called DALI. I just said, I just typed in a computer receiving a tune-up. Not bad, all right? I mean, I spent two minutes on it and, you know, it looks like a guy's putting wires in a computer. I mean, the computer did a great job. But, you know, I, I read medium.com a lot, which is a kind of a data science blog. And I think this quote kind of says it all. And this is one of the big challenges in this domain, the commoditization of AI and what it means. In AI, the limiting reagent is data. And, you know, in, in this domain in particular, getting good data is extremely complicated. So I really feel like I've spent the past 10 years of my life um, really doing a lot of scorched earth or earthwork with my neuropathologists and pathologists and dermatology colleagues, which is actually trying to both, you know, process and then also annotate these data sets so we can do quote unquote cool stuff with them. And the thing I learned 
first of all, is everyone's really busy and no one really actually wants to go through and do this. It's extremely boring. So there's a lot of effort that needs to, that needs to go into the UI user interface to make these tasks as simple and efficient as possible. Otherwise, what sounds like a good idea a year later, you know, you've had someone look at 15 pictures. So as an example, this is YOLO, you only look once. It's an AI model, I can download it on GitHub and it actually works. So one of my grad students, Juan Carlos Vizcarra is, you know, we've been working on this with, uh, with this team and the, you know, the model runs really well, but obviously it was not trained on, you know, neurofibrillary tangles, it was trained on cars and famous people and things. But fortunately, a lot of these AI models allow you to be relatively simply retrained. But here's some fun considerations, at least in an ideal world. So we need 1500 images per class. It's a lot of slides. We need 10,000 labeled objects per class as recommended. That's a lot of brown spots to look at. Also, there has to be a lot of image variety. Label consistency, I'll talk about this in a second. All instances of a class in an image must be labeled. Label accuracy, you know, and one time you call it an A and one time you call it a B and they turns out to be both A's, the system just, you know, if, if you don't know the answer, it's not gonna figure it out. So we've been working on this prod, um, project to differentiate um, intracellular uh, uh, NFTs basically in the hippocampus, trying to differentiate between INFTs and um, pre-NFTs. So I'm not gonna go specifically into this work, but you know, there's been quite a bit of disagreement even between our five experts. Like I said, limited data just because it's, it's tedious to do. And so again, what's the gold standard that we're comparing this against? So one of the things that we've done just to speed things up, ideally the model really wants a really fine boundary around the, the, the blob, in this case, the NFT or the tangle. Um, you can actually speed this up quite a bit. We just do point annotations. They click, you know, so a neuropathologist is, gen, or at least our team has been willing to, you know, go in and, you know, click three or 400 dots or 500 dots on a slide relatively quickly. If we made the test, we want you to actually individually circle each each shape. That will it will take too long, and they, we just won't generate enough data. And so, you know, what happens when you're when you put the data in YOLO and you get it back out? You know, we we've gotten some pretty good results. You know, I don't want to go through each blob, but you get it. When I was talking about exhaustive annotation, here's a good example. So here's a raw image. Here's our ground truth. So. Interestingly, our model doesn't predict this, this being, um, it doesn't predict this one, it, do, it does predict this one. So is this a bad job? Do we have, in, did, did we essentially miss this one in our ground truth? Why did it not pick this one? You get into a lot of these things where again, even when you have experts doing it, they may miss things, they may disagree. The other thing um, that, is a big problem in all of these things is I really don't want to develop some, you know, quote unquote state of the art algorithm to detect NFTs that only works well at Emory, the way Marla Gearing stained them in a five year period or something like that. So, you know, without going into too much detail, this and this same stain, but you can, they clearly look a little different. Just leave it at that. Um, so what we've been working on um, is really trying to harmonize Neuropath to develop more robust digital biomarkers. As many of you know, Neuropath is the gold standard for diagnosis, but it relies on semi-quantitative scores. So you know, our, my vision or our vision would be to create some sort of centralized repository um, across, really, it doesn't even have to be specific to ADRCs actually, really just for um, neuropathology. Really, there's a lot of effort that needs to require to harmonize data across centers. And ideally, we want some sort of open platform so we don't have to spend tens of thousands of dollars a year just to license software. Um, so in our pre-pilot, we've, we've gotten cases from five sites and we'd, we'd like to get essentially a single case from as many um, ADRCs as are willing to send us, send us slides. And once we get that, this actually allows me the opportunity to start you know, harmonizing what regions were collected, what stains were used, what do you call stains, you know, is you call it Beals, it's actually Bielchowski. So there's a lot of um, um, data wrangling involved in that. 
like I said, now that we've started getting, you know, five, six cases, we're starting to work on some data harmonization and start building kind of a, our standard data dictionary of stain names, region names, and we need to figure out what's consistent across centers. Um, you know, one of the things I spent a lot of time doing is building different widgets to allow you to explore and organize the data. So, you know, for a specific study, I may want to be able to find slides with certain Brock stages with certain clinical diagnosis that died at a certain age with a certain postmortem interval. If you have, if the data or the metadata is generated properly, you can build these sorts of faceted search or shopping cart like interfaces relatively um, easily. One of the things I'm also working on that's going pretty well is, again, I, and, and if you've used a peer error or whatever, switching between slides or whatever, these tools are generally not tuned for the data model that we may have in um, neuropathology. So I've been working on an interface with one of my widgets that basically allows you to quickly switch between regions and stains. And also it allows you to potentially look at more than one stain, at, uh, sorry, more than one slide at the same time. You can co-register or whatever. So this is a work in progress. But these are the sorts of tools that I think are going to be needed um, in order to you know, make this stuff tractable online. The other thing that we've been working on is really just tuning some of our algorithms um, so that we can basically make it easier for people to come up with parameters that work for these slides. So this is a cutout from a Jupyter notebook, but we're working on some sort of interactive widgets that'll make it a lot easier for you to um, in this case, it's basically just the simplest algorithm, positive pixel count, but it actually does a pretty good job of finding, you know, brown spots. So, you know, one of the things I want to make at least a, a weak pitch for is this idea of a shared neuropath cloud. One of the biggest features, which I'll talk about in a second, is you need to be able to bring your algorithms to the data. Um, I strongly think it should be open source. I think it should be cloud agnostic. Um, there needs to be ways that individual researchers can play around with the images, you know, like a Google Colab or Jupyter Notebooks. Ideally, users can have their own compute environments if, if they, um, and we make it set up. And most importantly, there's reference data sets. So one of my pet peeves when I'm reviewing um, papers in this domain is you'll see comments like, my model performs better on this task than blah, 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 blah. And essentially, you know, unless you have these real reference standards, you know, saying my model performs better on my data using benchmarks my grad student created, you know, it's, you know, take it with a grain of sand. So, you know, one of the things that would be nice is if we could develop some sort of centralized ground truth for AI development, um, you know, finding the blobs, you know, finding purple spots, it's not necessarily that hard of a task. Labeling the, the purple spots, is, is it background, is it schmutz, is it actually something I'm, in, I'm interested in? That's actually kind of the most, to me, the most important part. One thing since um, to think about as well is, Cloud storage and computation, you know, this stuff is, even though the cloud's great, it's not free. <laughs> so, um, you know, downloading these, you know, if, even if everything's centrally hosted, it can cost a lot of money to download this data and it can take hours, if not weeks sometimes to actually get the data. So, you know, even if I have this sort of, you know, um, you know, collection of slides in the cloud, you know, you need to be able to access them in place. It's really just not tractable to just download everything. And here's another example. I love Dolly. I want to see a fluffy white cloud raining gold coins, which I think is um, Google and Amazon's business model, which is great for them. Um, I literally typed that. It, it, it's not terrible, right? But if I just say I just wanted to download 25 slides from a public cloud, about 100 gigs of data. It'll take about an hour and it costs nine bucks. This is even more fun. So just storing 20 terabytes of data and at Emory, I think I've scanned 70 or 80, right? It's 500 bucks a month, six grand a year. It's not crazy money. If we had you know, 10 times as much, it would be $60,000 a month. That's a little worse. Now, what the fun thing, and they, this is where the cloud lock-in becomes a, a challenge, to download the 20, thousand gigabytes or 20 terabytes of data. And in most cases, most grad students would just want the data locally. They're like, hey, I want my own copy. It would cost $2,800 and someone has to pay for that. Um, now, just for comparison, if I just go to um, Newegg or Amazon and just buy my own 20 terabyte hard drive, it's 500 bucks as a five-year warranty. And you know, it'll hopefully last more than a month. 
I do want to briefly mention QPath, which is an open source desktop software that really is great. Um, it does a lot of the functionality. It's good. The thing that I want to differentiate though is QPath runs on data on your computer using your own compute resources. It's not the same thing as the DSA or these other platforms which do everything in the web. There's a lot of advantages to QPath um, on a small scale. But you know, if if every grad student needs to spend two thousand dollars just to download the eighteen, you know, uh, twenty hundred images or a thousand images or whatever, you know, that that can become a real challenge to um, to rapid iteration and development. So um, good news is I am done. I just want to thank Lee, who's been my long term corroborator for ten years, as well as the rest of the team, particularly Marlon, John, who are our local neuropath experts, who have you know taught me most of this and been the, uh, the linchpins to me being able to do anything. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, so I am getting some questions coming in, but uh, I was thinking we just start if the rest of the panelists could just briefly introduce yourselves, we can kick off some Q&A. Maybe start with Lee and then work our way. Hi, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Lee Cooper, I'm at Northwestern. Uh, work here with Maggie in the pathology department and uh, work with David on DSA and have an engineering background and software development. Awesome, thanks, and Ivy. Hello everyone, good morning. Thanks for um, letting me be here. My name is Ivy Nguyen. I'm one of the neuropathologists at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Um, I'm also a contributor to the Mayo ADRC and the Mayo Clinic Study of Aging. Um, I also do, I'm um, very interested in translational research, so I'm studying microglia in Alzheimer's disease, and I often use uh, digital pathology for those means and a lot of QPath. Great, and Thomas? Hi, yeah, Tom Pierce, University of Pittsburgh. I'm a neuropathologist with a background in neuroscience and biomedical engineering, uh, and I write a lot of open source code um, really uh, sort of feel a lot of kinship to David when he says that user interfaces are incredibly important and making things easy for our colleagues to use is critical. Uh, so I spent a lot of effort working on that kind of stuff. And then uh, Roddy. Hi, everyone. I'm Roddy Chete. I'm a neuropathologist at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I'm also uh, ADRC neuropathology core co leader and the clinical director of um, medical director of clinical IHC lab. As everybody else on the panel, like I'm also very interested in machine learning applications and image analysis in the neuropathology practice. And I'm also a big fan of QPath. Thank you. And thank you all very much for your participation today. Uh, very much appreciate it. So I'll just kick off uh, the first question that's come in is, are there any ways to threshold the reads such that low levels of phospho tau can be ruled out? For example, if we are looking at NFTs in transgenic mice, some of the epitopes will have low levels of signal in mice that represent normal phosphorylation of murine tau. Yeah. So. That's actually the demo I threw up didn't show you well because it wasn't pretty with colors, but that's essentially positive pixel count. It's just figuring those thresholds out and even QPath will do it. Um, the issue really is at scale, right? I not necessarily know what antibody you use. So should I, well, we hopefully do, but you know, actually um, Dr. Wynn may have played around more with PPC and QPath than I, <laughs> I did, but yeah, essentially this is where a lot of the tuning happens, right? You just have to know a priori, unless every, well, never happens, right? Unless everything's stained with exactly the same intensity, color, brightness, et cetera, et cetera, you, or antibodies or whatever, you need to shim things a little bit in order to actually get the results you want. Um, it's not hard, actually. It's just, um, you know, just work. Yeah, just to tune it. Oh, sorry, actually, go ahead, Tom. Uh, it, uh, yeah, I also have a comment, sorry, Abby. Uh, this uh, like threshold is can be pretty risky. And even like if you're dealing with just one slide, the background thresholding, it depends on the IC quality also, can be totally different from area to area. 
So like we tried just thresholding in QPath, it didn't really work. So we just applied like machine learning based on like individual areas for annotations. Yeah, and this is where the devil's in the details, right? So having a study where you have to go in and individually threshold each slide, if you have 50 slides, it's probably okay. If you have 5,000 slides, ugh, um, where you might need other, we'll call it widgets. But again, positive pixel count is really easy to understand. Whereas a machine learning model that custom thresholds and whatever, you know, it's 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 not something you can do in Photoshop automatically. Whereas you know, positive pixel count is, you know, how, how dark is it basically? So one, one thing I will mention is that, uh, you know, we've been working with NVIDIA uh, to integrate with some of their learn by example tools. So they have a tool called Monai Label, um, which is sort of learn by example. So you pick a region and you start clicking on cells and you just sort of adaptively provide feedback. Uh, and so, you know, I think this is a much more reliable approach than image thresholding. Um, we have integrated that tool with the digital slot archive, so you can actually use our user interface with when I label. And I think we can paste a link to that in the uh, chat. I'll go ahead and do that. Thanks. Yeah, that would be great. And uh, there's a request if you wouldn't mind uh, stopping your screen share. That would um, so that people could, I think. I, just... How do I stop? I just see resume share. And pause oh. share. Um, oh, there it is. I see it. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> We're good. Thanks. And then the next. I was going to say, actually, one more comment about the last question, um, because I think it does matter too about the, the antibodies. So, for example, at Mayo, we use AT8. So, you often can pick up a lot of pre tangles and like true nerfibly tangles. And I think that can be really tricky. So, it looks like P if they're using PHF, you may not have that much of an issue, but for sure, with our data set, having that amount of background, and especially more of the granular cytoplasmic staining, um, we used to do it manually, so I'd have to manually check the thresholds. And again, as you know, Dr. Gutman said, with 50 slides, it's not too bad, but with you know, 1,000, which is what we're going to be working towards, that's going to be really tedious. So we're also looking into more um, machine learning methods to kind of train the data set to recognize pre-tangle versus an NFT. And this goes back to the challenge I brought up earlier, which is these models are easy to train if you have a lot of labeled data. So, <laughs> you already know the answer. It's easy to figure it out. You're um, looking at the labelers. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, you're, you're a new member of the labeling team, but um, yeah, I, I reach out to you guys quite a bit because, you know. I think the guys. question is, the question is, what do you label, right? Because, you know, we've done studies where we have people label like literally 200,000 things and you probably don't need to label that many. It's it's about labeling the right examples. And so some of these tools that allow you to sort of iteratively work with the tool to refine an algorithm, I think are very powerful. So I saw Nina's comment about gamification. So for some of the stuff I've done in melanoma, we've taken some of those data sets and I think we call we use like Centaur Labs or whatever, which is more like a mechanical Turk. So I think the whole thing with gamification is it depends on the task. So finding a brown spot is, you know, my three-year-old could probably do it pretty well, but figuring out, is it a pre, I've been on lots of conversations and I wish John was here so I could give him a hard time, but is this an INFT or pre-NFT or an ABCD or an EFG, you know, whatever. When you start looking at these things, if you just screw around with the brightness and contrast, you'll get a different answer, right? So if John's in a dark room and Dr. Wynn's in a bright room, they may quote unquote be looking at the same thing, but it looks different. And then, you know, Maggie's on her phone or whatever, and she's zoomed in and it doesn't look like anything to her, you know, who knows? So, you know, this whole perception and labeling and um, I mean, I think gamification for part of the drudgery, like for example, if we need reasonable white matter or gray matter masks on everything, I think that could be turned into a game, you know, trace trace your label or whatever or find the bubble i don't know whatever whatever boring task that we would want to improve our ai models that could be gamified but a lot of the like the inft versus pre-nft versus ghost tangle versus whatever you know the number of people that can differentiate that are probably mostly on this call then they'd still argue about it that's great. I think we have another question before that. Let's see if I can. 
Can I ask Is there question? a way to trace? Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, have you ever, or do you have experience with Omero server? Um, like yeah, quite a bit. Um, it's an, it's quote unquote similar to what we're doing. I found the performance, it's written in Java, which just personally mm -hmm. I, I hate. Like I like Python and um, also the performance. Um, Amero was originally designed for like small microscope images. And so at least I feel like the architecture is probably really good at that. But anytime I've used any Amero tools to even try to open like bioformats, just open a whole slide image, it crashes, it kills my system. It's just, I, I just don't like it. It also has like a thick client model to, to, for a lot of the capabilities that I was interested in. So I'm not, it's, it's obviously lots of groups use it, but you know, my group doesn't because we built the DSA instead. <laughs> but at the time, again, this was a decade ago, Omero didn't work at all with whole slide images. Obviously it's evolved since then, but the other thing that's kind of nice about our system, it's Dockerized and it's cloud agnostic. I, maybe it's changed, but the last time I checked, Omero's performance on like S3 type buckets did, was garbage. So the DSA can be employed on Google, doesn't really care what the back end is. Obviously having an S, NVMe SSD on your laptop is going to load files faster than an S3 bucket in the cloud, but it actually, you know, our system has been designed to for that sort of, you know, cloud storage model and it works quite well. I, for a while I had a couple of DSA instances just on using S3 storage and stuff like that. So Amero is great. I just, you know, like I like my, it's my, I like my own um, widgets, but. Yeah, I mean, uh, so the Omero, the reason why I look into it, Omero is like, I think I found that they have like uh, all the instructions that you can deploy it on Amazon server without like knowing too much. Like very oh, we can get, I mean, honestly, I, feel free to email me offline, but we've gotten our system to the point where Docker compose up and it'll just work. Um, and, you know, I've deployed it on a S, um, Google, Azure, what's the other one? AWS, you know, once you have a, once you have a quote unquote server running, it's just Docker compose up, get pulled Docker compose up. So, um, I, you know, I'm happy to, you know, reach out to me offline and I can, you know, get you set up. Sure. And one other question, like does um, uh, your archive like cover all, all the, all kinds of like um, whole slide images? Oh, uh, so our system is specifically designed to be completely agnostic to everything. It has no schema. It has no model. It's buckets and files. Most of my work is customizing it, but like our de-identification tool out of the box is going to work with Aperio, Hamamatsu NDPI, Big Tiff. Um, so we have our own and it's a class, so it can be extended. We have our own image reader. So as I get weird file formats like CZ, CZI isn't super weird, but you know we have a large image module that, um, and this is what funding agencies are for, right? If it turns out your research group uses a scanner that we don't have good support for, we just need to get some examples. You know, fortunately, I don't have to do it, but we, you know, pay Kitware to <laughs> add support, and then it just gets contributed to the open source community. Even with like Aperio images, we run into like some of the newer Aper like Aperio worked forever, and then someone had a new scanner, and for some reason, label images were no longer being de-identified or whatever because they changed a bit somewhere. You know, once we figured that out, you know. Uh, two hours later, we were able to make a PR and, you know, get it fixed. But like I said, it's also open source, right? So, you know, it's, you can do it yourself. You can, you know, chat with us to do it. You can pay Kitware to do it if you need to. So, um, you know. Yeah, I'm guessing that was the GT450 scanner that came out. That is indeed correct. And yeah, I like this. To use more of that has the uh, SVS file format is somewhat different in the GT450 file. Slightly. It's, it's, it's different enough to break things, but not different enough to know you were breaking things until you're like, wait, where'd that go? Or, you know, just things disappear. Or we had all sorts of weird things. Because remember, most of these formats are proprietary. So you really are reverse engineering this stuff. You know, it's not like there's a manual you can go to in most cases. You just have to like change the file, in our case, redact bits, load it back in their Aperio client and see if it still works, you know? Again, it didn't take months to do, but you, you know, it's a constant game of whack-a-mole with these things. Because again, there's no standard. 
Oh, that's great. Um, just going back to the prior question, it is, is there a way to trace objects that may be out of the plane of view, for instance, microglia processes or axonal extension? Yeah, so we have, I mean, I didn't show the annotation tools because it's, it's too slow when I'm using Zoom. But yeah, I mean, our widgets and Tom has some cool widgets as well, where you can just, you know, you can draw circles, you can draw squares, you can do point fill with some of the stuff Tom's done. Um, in terms of real out of plane, in terms of Z stacks, we haven't done a lot of stuff with like quote, real Z stacks in a long time. I mean, Lee can chat more about it. Um, the support's kind of there. We just haven't used it. I, you know, it would require some slight modifications. Yeah, you, you really need to have scanned it with multiple planes if you want to do that kind of thing. And then support for Z stacked images, which get enormous, is much more limited. I think you guys do have some support in the I have I have it doing it. I just haven't with I mean basically you just change the frame number so it's really easy. But then I'm like, well, if you draw something, do you want that to show up only on the Z slice that it was drawn on? Do you want it to be like a MIP projection? Lot, you know, it's it's that's what grant money's for, right? You need to have a good use case so you can, you know, build out that functionality. But, you know, one of the things I spend a lot, and Lee and I spend a lot of our time is, is we try to make the tools as generic as possible so it can adapt to a lot of use cases. But I can guarantee if you tried to run all the histomics DK algorithms with the default settings we have right now that were tuned for cancer, you're gonna get crappy results. It's not like we have to start from scratch and rebuild something that will go through, you know, 800 billion bits of imaging and pull out blobs and annotate them or whatever. But, I, you know, that's, you know, the, obviously these things need to be tuned for different domains, for different stains, for, you know, whatever, whatever the domain is. Great. I have another question. Um, which of these is best for medical records? For example, if I want to find records that report sleep apnea, disrupted sleep or sleep hangovers, on the same records, can you do this with any of these tools? Um, I'll say no with a star. I mean, so if the metadata, if you have a list of problems, if, you, if, if, these, if you had a slide and it was associated with a problem list or something like that, and it was an array and you know, some people contained A, some people contained B and some people contained C, you could go to the interface in our faceted search widget and just click all the ones you want and then it would just show you those slides. Um, but you know, I, I don't wanna get into ontologies and ICD-9 and all that stuff. That's a whole painful conversation that um, I spend most of my time at the VA dealing with that sort of stuff, but you know, it's, you know, I can show you like how it, it would look. So hopefully this will work, right? So if I wanted to look for, in your case, you would have an array of diagnosis. You click on this one and then you click on this one and then you would find 77 results or 32 or none or all of them, I guess, right? So if the metadata that you wanted existed, it's possible to build, it's relatively easy to expose it and make that searchable. But if it's, you know, it, it, it's like anything, right? It's quote unquote, just work as long as the data is there. Um, now I will stop sharing. We. I think that's actually all the questions that have come in. So we've been flying through. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on anything or share any experience or what not to do. <laughs> I have another question, so I if yeah. you can comment on. Uh, I saw there was a QR code on the slide. Are those QR codes readable by? Yeah. Um, that's one of the things that we're working on next. We want to have our DID tool be able to burn in a QR code as it replaces the label based on whatever scheme or organization you want. And I think this is going to be the next thing. I, I hope, knock on wood, we may have just gotten an SBIR grant to actually develop this functionality further. But a lot of times those QR codes or, a, or 2D barcodes or whatever contain stuff that probably should have been removed, but most people don't speak QR code. And I've also seen things where like, you know, you guys will put a label, like a white label on top of something as part of your de-identification process. But if you try not very hard, you can actually see <laughs> the barcode underneath. 
And so in theory, we may have to do something where we futz around with brightness and contrast and just try to read the barcodes to see if it contains any PHI or whatever. But again, that's what grant funding's for, that's what funding's for because you know, it's this never ending, um, it's like whack-a-mole of, you know, find the scary stuff. I think um, something we need, David, is a, a schema that can map, you know, data that's contained in the QR code to things like metadata or the file name, um, you know, in, in a way that users uh, who are not technically savvy can define that. So, yeah. you know, they can grab, for example, sample information and provide, you know, what fields they want and then map those into like a file name or something like that. Yeah, and this is something we've been debating. At Emory, most of the slides I have have not had any sort of consistent barcoding on it to even start developing it. Fundamentally, the interfaces wouldn't be that hard to build, right? You'd say, here's the 2D barcode, here are the fields it puts out, and you know, you have the, some, it's either about the stain, it's about the patient, it's about the date or about the, I don't know, like there's probably not that many fields that a standard QR code would contain that would be relatively easy to map. The hard part really is just the game of whack-a-mole where you call it PT, you know, Thomas's group calls it patient, some call it sample, you know, all the sorts of, um, you know, the dictionary problem. But well, it's probably safer to always remove the label entirely. I agree. <laughs> and like, even if you put a sticker over something that has your new data, make people enter it again in a clean format instead of relying on stickers for exactly those issues, and then just always remove the label and replace it. Yeah, but this goes into arguably somewhat of a cost question, right? So if I never want to delete raw data because it makes me have anxiety, which is why I'm a psychiatrist. If I delete the label, I can no longer figure out what that image is anymore. So then theoretically, I probably need to keep a copy somewhere in case I screw something up. But now do I put it in Glacier or some long-term storage or, you know, like it's none of this stuff is actually hard um, as you know, Dr. Pierce, it's just sort of figuring out what, you know, what makes sense for your use case, right? I agree, I don't really wanna ever have a data collection with whole slide in with the original label on it. I find it a total disaster, but I guarantee I'm going to screw up pulling metadata out of a whole slide image label at some point in my life. And then I'll be like, Maggie, can you re-upload those slides? I knew it took three and a half weeks, but sorry about that. You know, like it's, you know, it's basically just figuring out data governance, right? Yeah, I think you should presume barcodes to contain PHI, right? And they, oh, are, yeah, yeah. they are readable by a lot of open source packages, but some of our better organized researchers actually do put sample information for their research specimens in barcodes. And it's it would be nice to be able to support that. Yeah, we had that, I did a Fox project a while ago where it was pretty easy because it was thousands of the same label that I generated myself. The issue really is just the Wild West problem where everyone does things a little differently and you know, this is us coming up with a tool that solves all those use cases for everyone on the planet is complicated. Us solving it for Lee's group because he helps write the software and he wants to work on it. You know, that's a more tractable problem. Um, oh, I like Dr. Nelson's question. Pre-analytic variables. Um, that's one of the things that we're actually trying to work on um, as we get slides from across centers, we want to know the antibodies, we want to know the preparation, we want to know the slice thickness. And that's one of the reasons I actually want to just have slides to look at, because visually, even if quote unquote, everything's the same, and they look completely different, I need to figure out, is it because why, you know, is it, is it a real difference? Is it a biological difference? Or is it a, you know, yeah, the, the, the potential, it's not just a potential for systematic differences, it's a guarantee of systematic differences. And the best algorithms can adjust for it, but you have to have the variability, the range of variability that's sort of in your, in that data, in your training sets in order for that to happen. So it's important to have diverse training data so that you don't have things that are outside of the uh, trained algorithm that are being analyzed and having the systemic systematic differences just dominating everything. Yeah, this is the catch 22, right? If I showed you that example where it was just a lot browner than one of the other stains for the same region. If it's never seen a slide like that, it's just going to do badly. 
<laughs> just, <laughs> I think we're just about out of time, but I just wanted to echo uh, Brittany Duggar's comment, uh, just to remind everyone that the neuropathology cores should have received an email from Dr. Tyke to complete a survey. So if you have anybody on hasn't completed that survey, uh, it would be great if you could so that we can address uh, some of these questions in more detail. And I think we're about, we're out of time, but yeah, thank you everyone again for your participation. This is really great. Um, yeah, I think it's a powerful tool and hopefully we'll continue to progress in this area of research. And um, although no webinars are scheduled for the future at this time, we're um, open to suggestions and open to potentially hosting future webinars um, at a later date, depending on specific interest or topics um, so that people in the group might be most interested in. So thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>